What's up guys, this is Mr. Mahmood and you're watching video three of the microorganisms unit. In this unit we're going to focus in on the third line of defense, which is what we consider the specific immune response. So up to this point we've talked about the first and second lines of defense, which are non-specific, which is basically how your body attacks or defends against everything the same way. Uh, but as with any other scenario, if you're going at something a certain way, the same way you would attack against anything else and it's not working for you, then you need to go back to the drawing board, figure out another way of attack, figure out a more specific attack, and hopefully a better way to try to control the problem or fix the problem, whatever it may be. In this case, there's no exception. If we're down to the point where we're on our third line of defense, our non-specific stuff has failed us, and now we're to the point where we have to, get, we have to figure out exactly what the point of attack is going to be, we have to figure out exactly what the problem is and exactly how we're going to fight against it. Hopefully, this third line will let us be able to control the population. And if we can, great, everything can get back to normal. If not, then we have basically two options. We can take advantage of basic any, any sort of medical advancements that we have available to us with, uh, with modern medicine, or our body simply will be overtaken by the pathogen and there's nothing left for us to be able to do. So uh, hopefully we never get to that point. Let's walk through what the third line of defense can do for us. Before we get into that, we need to first discuss the difference between the two general categories of infections. Uh, in previous videos, we talked about how there are multiple um, categories or culprits of uh, possible pathogens. But really, with humans, it pretty much comes down to two types of infections. Most of the time uh, that you would get sick as a human, or most of the time we feel symptoms of being sick, it all comes from these two categories of infections. The first one are bacterial infections, and the second are viral infections. So because we're going to be talking about very specific ways your immune system attacks them, we should probably talk about some key differences between bacterial and viral infections because that definitely plays a role in how your body is going to attack against them. It doesn't attack against them the exact same way. Uh, similar, but not exactly the same. So there are a few key things I want you to know as key differences between bacterial infections and viral infections. And I hope from some of the stuff we've been doing in class, you could already tell me a few of them. Um, for example, <coughs> when we talk about uh, living and non-living, one of these two is living. Which one? Good. The bacterial infection are their own living organisms. That's a very key concept you need to think about here. Bacteria is one of the six kingdoms. So we have a huge population of these organisms that are fully capable of going through the eight characteristics of life. So bacteria are considered living. That's very important to think about here. So along those sides, the virus then is not considered living. So a virus is non-living, which means that it does not have all eight characteristics of life. So along those lines, because we understand bacteria is living and a virus is non-living, that also plays a very important role in what's necessary for each one of them to function. Because bacteria are living, here's the key, I need you to make sure you know, bacteria do not require a host in order to function. They do not require a host cell to 
be able to reproduce, replicate, and function. Whereas a virus absolutely does require a host cell because it's non-living on its own. Bacteria, because they're living, they're independent. They can function independently. The ones that are disease-causing are heterotrophs, which means just like us, they have to go get their food from somewhere else. So they're not completely independent, but they all they really need is a nutrient source. They can function on their own. They don't have to take advantage of another cell's components and organelles and parts to be able to do what it needs to do. Bacteria are fully functional. They can do their own thing as long as they can get some nutrients. Well, virus doesn't work that way. Viruses completely depend on a host cell because they're not capable of doing the, doing the steps for their own replication. They have to take over a cell and then use the cell's ability to do the replication steps for the virus. So another key difference between the two, because viral uh, infections are non-living infections, they do require a host. Bacterial infections do not require a host. Uh, even though they, they're different about what they need, if we're talking about harmful categories of each, in particular with bacteria, then we do also discuss the fact that they kill cells. So when we talk about disease, we're talking about damage to our body. So both of these types of infections destroy cells, but they do them in entirely different ways. So think about this. It has everything to do with the fact that one's living and one's not. With a viral infection, hopefully you know this by now, but what kills the cell in a viral infection is the eventual bursting of the cell at the end of a virus's lytic cycle, that release step that we talked about before. Because a virus is in, in the cell and it's become a just basic viral factory inside of that cell, you have so many viruses filling up like a balloon, the cell bursts. And that bursting of the cell, destroying of the cell membrane, that's what kills the cell because now there's no more... Um, homeostasis, no more regulation of what's going in and out, so that's, that's why the cell dies. So a viral infection destroys cells because of the, the lytic cycle, because of the bursting of the cell at the end of the lytic cycle. So viral replication is what actually kills the cells. The bursting of the viral, um, the viruses at the end of replication, that's what actually kills the cells. Bacteria do not kill cells for that reason. Bacteria can function on their own. They don't need to be in a cell in order to replicate. So they replicate pretty much anywhere. Granted, a lot of times it's easier for bacteria to get into a cell because it's a more controlled environment to replicate, but they don't have to. And that's not what actually kills the cell. The key thing here is this is actually what we consider a, an, a parasitic to almost uh, predation scenario because the bacteria feeds off of the cells and gains the nutrients from the cells and that process is what actually kills the cells losing all of its nutrients and, and important components is what kills the cell so it's the bacteria's metabolism the actual ability of a bacteria to take external energy <coughs> and use it internally it's that bacterial metabolism that actually kills the cell so viral replication is what kills the cell in a viral infection but bacterial metabolism is what actually kills the cell in a bacterial infection. They both kill cells, they're both very dangerous, but one kills it just because of the replication process, it just gets so full it causes it to burst. The other actually feeds off of the cell to the point where it kills the cell. A virus is not capable of feeding off of anything. It doesn't have any kind of metabolism on its own, it can't use energy at all. So a virus doesn't feed off cells, it simply fills it up so much that they, that they burst. So key difference between the two is understanding how and why the cells are damaged within each infection. And then finally, what I want you to understand is what your body can, or what we can do beyond what our body is capable of in terms of modern medicine, particularly with types of medications called antibiotics. Antibiotics, by, by name, means against life, against living. So an antibiotic is a way to go against a living population, a way to fight off a living population. So which of these two do you think antibiotics are effective against? Exactly, the living population. So antibiotics can be effective against bacteria. They cannot be effective against a virus. That's an important thing I need you to understand. Because a virus is non-living, anything that goes against the living components doesn't do anything for a virus. So remember this. 
uh, antibiotics are only effective against bacteria. They are not effective against viruses. Antibiotics themselves, without getting into too much detail, because we'll talk about this more later, but antibiotics are actually types of fungus. They're types of molds um, that scientists accidentally recognized as actually being really good at controlling bacterial populations. So the, depending on the type of fungus and the species of fungus, you get different types of antibiotics grown in a laboratory. So if you have an antibiotic, it's put against a bacterial infection, and it actually works to slow down the bacterial replication. So if you can slow down the bacterial replication, that means there's less of a population of the disease for your body to worry about, so your immune system can usually take care of it a little more, a little more quickly and without having a, such a strong attack against it. Um, so an antibiotic does work against bacterial infections. Now, it doesn't work against all of them. There's something that we'll get into later uh, with natural selection towards the end of the semester uh, called antibiotic resistance. That means that over time, if an antibiotic is given too much and too often to the same species of bacteria, and that bacteria is overexposed to a specific type of antibiotic, it'll eventually get to the point where the antibiotic is not as effective against that bacteria as it, as it once was. The bacteria develop what's called a resistance to the infection. We'll talk about what that means and all the detail behind that later. That's not something to get into yet. But I do want you to understand that even though I say antibiotics work against bacteria, not all antibiotics work against all bacteria. In fact, there are a few bacteria out there now that are considered sort of like the superbugs that have become resistant to just about any type of antibiotic that we are aware of in the medical community, which is really scary. But again, most bacterial infections can be controlled by some form of antibiotics. Now on the other side, a virus does, pretty much laughs in the face of an antibiotic. Antibiotics do nothing for a virus because it doesn't have any of the components that the antibiotic works against to try to control. So antibiotics are not effective against viruses, very important thing to understand. So if you understand those key differences between a bacterial infection and, and a viral infection, keep that in the back of your mind because we'll be referring back to it as we go through the detail of the third line of defense because they're very specific about what they do to attack an, a, a certain disease. So a viral infection and what we do to attack that one is going to be different than a bacterial infection. All right, so let's keep that in mind. All right, so quick review, uh, first two lines of defense. The first line of defense is what we consider our barrier, uh, which pretty much includes our skin, and then the areas that are protecting the parts that are not directly covered by skin, so the saliva in our mouth, mucus in our nose, uh, tears in our eyes, earwax in our ears, all of those things are considered basic barriers, and that even includes, within your digestive system, the stomach acids that you have in your stomach also works to try to kill off whatever you're eating that could be dangerous, um, and it usually does a pretty good job of that. So that's your first uh, line of defense. If something passes through your first, if something passes through your first line of defense, one way or the other, it can break through your skin or goes into your digestive system, and the acids don't take care of it, or it goes up your nose or through your uh, through your ear ducts or eyes, or we breathe it in. One way or the other, it's able to pass through your first line of defense. We get into the inflammatory response, which is again a non-specific attack. It it is an actual physical attack against a pathogen. So it does you do start noticing a change because you're increasing this attack in your body, and you're basically trying to set up an uncomfortable environment wherever the pathogen is. Uh, and you're doing what you can to kill off the pathogen. So you release histamine into the area, causes the redness and the swelling and all the irritation. You get all of these phagocytes to the site of the infection. They go through your bloodstream and they get to where the infection is and the phagocytes try to eat and bring in and destroy as many of those pathogens as possible to hopefully try to control the population. But again, regardless of the type of pathogen, your immune response in this second phase is pretty much the same. The same type of inflammatory response will occur. All right, so if that doesn't work, and we still have a population that can bypass this blanket attack that we do against any sort of pathogen, now we need to get figure, figure out exactly what the problem is and exactly how to attack against it. So now we're going to get into the third line of defense. And there are a lot of little players that play very important roles in this, and we're going to walk through each one of them. Keep in mind the diagrams here are purely visual. Uh, they don't look like these things. Most of these cells are all little tiny circles that are all the, exactly the same color and there's no true distinction between them. Um, <clears throat> but we're just trying to visualize things to make things a little, little clearer to understand and distinguish. So 
don't be surprised if you see some of these kind of odd shapes. So the first cell we're going to focus in on for the third line of defense is really a segue from the second to the third. So we consider a macrophage. A macrophage is a type of phagocyte. So it's actually a cell that's functioning in the second line of defense already and will continue what it's doing into the third line of defense within our discussion. So the macrophage plays a very important role when we have certain types of cells that are considered either T cells or B cells. T cells are made in the thymus gland, which, are, um, which is an important gland in your, in your uh, upper chest region right here that makes all of these T cells, uh, or B cells that are actually made in your bone marrow um, that are responsible for certain functions as well. So in this case, we're going to talk about a type of T cell in the thymus called a helper T cell that works directly with the macrophage. Then we have another type of B cell, again, B from the bone, that uh, plays an important role. These B cells are also known as plasma B cells that we'll talk about. What they make, the plasma B cells make uh, types of proteins called antibodies that are very important, we'll get to as well. <clears throat> another type of T cell besides the helper T cell, also made in the thymus gland, is, and um, we have the memory B cell in this case that is responsible for playing a very important role at the end of the infection and then continuing on after you feel better. And then when it's all said and done, we do have a certain type of cell called a suppressor T cell that sort of brings everything back to normal once the population has been controlled, assuming the population has been controlled. So if all of these things work the way they're supposed to, this together will figure out the exact attack against an infection based on every detail of it and hopefully be able to control that infection and get things back to normal. All right, so let's walk through this scenario step by step. Now, uh, in these diagrams, you're going to see a lot of visuals. You're going to see a lot of things moving around, uh, uh, diagrams and things like that. We're going to simulate everything as a viral infection, even though what you're going to look at as the pathogen doesn't look like the viruses that we've been talking about before. It probably looks more bacterial than anything else, but we're going to use the viral discussion here. So first step is something is passed through the first and second lines of defense. So now our third or specific line of defense is going to need to get to work. So let's say there's a virus out there with a certain shape spike that has found the cell that has the key that's the perfect match for its lock or back and forth, vice versa, whatever. The two proteins are perfect shapes and perfect fits. So now because that virus has found the right cell, it's a perfect match. It can enter into the cell to fight it off. Now bacteria, remember, doesn't necessarily have to enter a cell. It can just start feeding off of a cell that it can take nutrients from. But if we're talking about a virus, it's gotten to the cell and it can invade the cell. So we're now going to begin the parts of the lytic cycle here, right? So if a virus is past the sec first and second lines of defense, now we need some cells to get to work. There's already going to be an inflammatory response occurring, which means we already have these phagocytes in the site of the infection. So the macrophage is going to be our next step here. The macrophage will recognize the threat because it's at the site of the infection. The macrophage is sort of like a, like a security guard. It's there patrolling your body. It'll go where it hears there's a threat, like the release of histamine or the release of other chemicals that your body sends out. It'll go to the side of that infection, the side of that threat, and it'll recognize it and bring it in. So the macrophage is exactly what it's called. Macro means large, phage means eater. So it's literally a large eater. It's gonna find the problem, the virus there, the pathogen. It'll bring it in as a macrophage. It surrounds it and then brings it in. But here's the kicker. Instead of completely just destroying it and burning it all off and chemicals and acids and, and just, just completely disintegrating it, it breaks it apart so that it can't function anymore. But then it takes all of those spikes, those receptor proteins, and puts it out on the surface because this is what's going to be used to figure out exactly how to fight against it. Every virus has a very unique shaped receptor, right? And it's those shapes of the receptor that are letting it get into the cells that it needs to get into. So if I am trying to control this viral population, what I really need to do, my main goal of attack is going to be to stop those viruses from getting into any more cells. Because every time a virus can get into one cell, it can replicate thousands more from that one. So if I can keep them from getting into more cells, then I can help, <coughs> I can help to control the population. That's not the only thing against the bacterial infection. It helps because, again, bacteria, if they can't get into a cell, they can't feed off of it as well. So it does help to keep a bacteria from getting in, but that's not enough just for a bacteria. But for a virus, that's really the most important thing. If you can keep them from getting into a cell, a virus can't do anything. So the, the process of stopping a virus from getting in is going to start by figuring out how it gets in. What key does that virus have that 
will match up to a certain cell. If I can figure out the key that it has, then I can figure out how to block that key and keep it from getting where it's supposed to go. So the macrophage is the first part of this. By breaking down the problem, the pathogen, and putting those keys out on the surface, it's basically saying, hey, here's the problem, here's the culprit, and these are the keys that it has to try to figure out how to get into other cells. That's about the limit of the macrophage's work. Right? It's pretty much just like a security guard. It can get, can get you to a certain point. But from that point on, you need to call in reinforcements. So the macrophage now knows there's a threat. It knows the specific shapes of that receptor. And it puts those receptor shapes back out on its own surface to show to the next cell, the cell that can really figure out what's going on. That cell that can figure out what's going on is called a helper T cell. Now these guys are extremely important. I've made a couple of references to the helper T cell as like the general of your immune response. So the helper T cell goes to the site of the infection. The, the, the macrophages send out a chemical signal to start bringing helper T cells to the site of the infection. And the helper T cells have their own shapes of locks and keys. So these helper T cells are just going to go one by one to the site of the infection and try matching up its own receptors to the receptors that are out on the macrophage. Because remember, those receptors out on the macrophage were originally in the virus. So basically at this point, the helper T cell is figuring out the exact shape that the macrophage has found that's directly on the virus. Once it's able to find a very specific match, it now knows the exact shape that the cells that would match to it are going to be because if if I have say if the macrophage uh, recognizes a triangle shaped spike from the virus then that means the helper T cell that matches up to it has sort of like a V shape and the V shape fits perfectly to a triangle shape so that means now the helper T cell knows the exact shape that the cells have that are a perfect match for the virus because if the virus has that perfect triangle the cell has that perfect V, those are the two that are going to match in. So the, cell with, the cells that have this V shape are the ones that are in trouble because those are the ones that the virus can match up to. So now the helper T cell knows exactly what shape these viruses are looking for. If they can find that shape, that's what's going to allow them to get in. So that's very important. So now the helper T cell knows exactly the shape of the virus's proteins on the outside. So uh, another word for proteins on the outside, by the way, is antigen. So if you ever hear a reference to an antigen, that's talking about surface proteins. So I'll just use that term from now on to, to make things a little more clear. So the virus's antigens are this triangle shape, and then the antigens on the surface of the, of the cells that they attack are that opposite V shape. So now the helper T cell knows what that shape is. It's going to send out a chemical message for a very specific type of plasma B cell to get to work and a very specific type of killer T cell to get to work. So we'll talk about each one of these one by one. But it's important to stress that the B cells that are made in your bone are all very unique. Each one has a very specific role. They all make antibodies, the B cells, they all make antibodies, which we'll talk about, but they each, they each make a different one. And each antibody that's made has a unique shape of antigen. Those proteins are slightly different shapes for each plasma B cell that makes each antibody. And the killer T cells, and all the T cells in your thymus, they have very important roles as well. They only recognize specific shapes. So you have millions of different B cells and millions of different T cells in your body. But in any given infection, there's usually only one or just a couple that actually are the perfect match and the, the ones that would really need to get to work. If it wasn't for the helper T cell, and this, this will come in handy later, if it wasn't for the helper T cell figuring out the problem and then sending out the signal for that exact B cell and the exact killer T cell, then those cells would never know there was a problem. Which means even though you have the cells in your body necessary to control an infection, if you don't have that helper T cell to figure out the problem, like the general to figure out the problem, then they'll never send out the signal for those other cells to get to work. So the helper T cell plays a critical, critical role here. They're the ones, they're the connections between the macrophage and the really specific B cells and T cells. Without that connection, you have no immune response. So the helper T cell figures out the exact shape of that antigen and then sends out a message for the B cells and the killer T cells that work against that exact shape. So here's what I mean when I say work against them. The plasma B cells, those blue ones in the shape here, plasma B cells produce what are called antibodies. Antibodies are the 
proteins that are the opposites of antigens. So an antigen, again, is a surface protein of a certain shape. So again, if I know the virus's surface protein and the virus's antigen is that triangle, the helper T cell knows that it needs to make, your body needs to make antibodies that are the shape of that V. So it's going to find the plasma B cell that is capable of making the antibodies that have their own antigens that are the shape of that V, which are the perfect match. So it sends a signal for that B cell to make the antibody that's the perfect match. Those antibodies will be produced in millions and they'll get sent to the site of the infection. And even before the antibodies are produced, once that plasma B cell is recognized that it needs to get to work, it gets the message from that helper T cell, it's just one cell. And it's going to need to make millions and millions of these antibodies. So to make itself work a little more easily, as soon as it knows it needs to get to work, it's going to actually start multiplying itself. So instead of that, just having one B cell making antibodies, you're going to have one turning into two, into four, eight, 16, 32, 64. Very quickly, you're going to have thousands and thousands of these specific B cells that all make the exact antibody that we need for this specific infection. So all of these new B cells now that are identical copies of each other make all of these antibodies that are the exact opposite shape, that V shape that we talked about. And they're all going to jump to the site of the infection and they're going to attach themselves to the virus on the spikes on the outside. Now this attachment is going to do one of two things. For a virus, it blocks the virus. It's basically like putting a big cork on the key so that the key doesn't work in the lock anymore. Because if I can cover up the key, now the key can't get into the lock the way it used to before. So that's pretty much all you have to do for a viral infection. If I can release the antibodies, make the right ones, and then send them out to block the viruses from getting into any more cells, then those viruses, if they can't get into a cell, usually within about a 24-hour period, that virus just breaks apart. I don't want to say the virus dies because it was never living. It just breaks apart. So that's great. For a viral infection, this is pretty much all you have to take care of. Now, for a bacterial infection, it's not quite this easy because those antibodies going onto the surface of a bacteria sure may make it more difficult for the bacteria to get into a cell. But remember, it doesn't actually have to get into a cell to function. The bacteria can still feed off of cells from outside. So it's not enough just to try to block a bacteria from getting in. With a bacterial infection, the big role that antibodies play is that they tag the pathogen for this next cell that's going to be coming into play. So one way or the other, the antibodies do two things. For a virus especially, they block the virus from being able to enter in to any new host cells. But for a bacterial infection specifically, they tag that bacteria for the next cell. So the whole point here is with a bacterial infection, the antibodies attaching will tell the rest of your immune system that these are the specific cells that your body needs to kill off. Otherwise, your body would just go around and killing every cell it sees and you don't want you don't want that happening but it will only go after the specific killer T cell the specific one that was instructed by the helper T cell to get to work is only looking for this exact shape of antibody anything tagged by this antibody is going to be destroyed by the next cell so the next cell are our assassins what we think of as the killer T cell so these killer T cells again are very specific they were instructed by the helper T cell after it found the right match so that the killer T cells are now on a hunt for anything tagged by those antibodies. If I see a cell, and I'm a killer T cell, and I see something that's tagged by my antibodies, and those are the exact shape antibodies I'm looking for, I'm gonna go and attack it and kill that cell. So now we're gonna get a very specific attack on the cells that are tagged by the pathogen. At the same time, if there are any sort of uh, cells that were affected and uh, tagged by the antibodies that did manage to get into a cell for any reason, then those cells that have been infected are now going to become collateral damage. Basically, they're going to be killed for the greater good. It's be much better to kill one to save millions than to let that one allow it to grow and cause more serious problems. So if a killer T cell sees an antibody anywhere, whether it's outside of a cell or even inside of a cell, it's going to attack the, the pathogen. So these killer T cells are what are eventually going to control the population. So you've finally gotten things under control here. You had the helper T cell identify the specific shape of antigen that the, path that the pathogen had, the virus has, and now it's going to send out specific messages for the exact plasma B cell that can make the exact an opposite antibody, 
and it's going to send a message for the exact killer T cell. It's going to look for that exact opposite antibody. So once those two specific cells get to work, that's when your immune response is really going to be in full effect and you're really able to fight off the whole infection. So your killer T cells and your uh, plasma B cells making the antibodies don't go to work until the helper T cell figures out exactly which of those cells we need and then sends out the chemical message for them. So at this point, we have the viruses getting blocked getting tagged by these antibodies so they can't get into any more host cells and any cells that may have already been invaded by the virus are getting attacked by the killer T cells as well so the whole population of viruses should be able to get controlled at this point and with a bacterial infection the antibodies are tagging the bacteria so that these killer T cells can find the cells that are really harmful to us and kill them off uh, and if any cells were infected, again, kill those off as well. So the same kind of double attack is happening here, and we're able to finally control the population. Once the population is controlled, at this point, your body can sort of slow down. And remember, I told you that one B cell, in order to make enough antibodies, replicated itself a lot of times. So now that one B cell turned into thousands of B cells, and you have way more cells than you need. And on a side note, this, this is what causes all of the symptoms that you feel when you're sick. If you're ever sick, you feel symptoms because of what your body is doing to attack the pathogen. The pathogen itself and the killing of cells isn't what you're feeling when you're sick. What you're feeling is what your body's doing to control that population. So all of the symptoms that you think of when you're cold, when you have a basic flu or a viral infection or even a bacterial infection, all of those symptoms or your body trying to control the infection. So one of those symptoms, if you like have the flu or a really bad cold and you ever go to the doctor, you might notice the doctor will kind of pinch around uh, just underneath your jaw here and feel for two little bumps. You can probably feel them now, even if you're not sick. Feel right here, just underneath your jaw to the right and left of, of your, um, your, your uh, trachea here. You can feel these two little bumps those bumps are glands that are part of your lymphatic system, which is where your immune cells are stored. When you're sick, like I said, that one B cell is turning into thousands, that's where they are. So if you have just one, then it's usually pretty thin. But if you have thousands, then it really swells up. And so when a doctor's feeling around there, he's not just trying to look smart, but he's just sitting there feeling for those swollen glands. If the glands are really swollen, that's a very easy sign for the doctor to see, yeah, you're sick and your body's fighting off the infection. You're doing a good job fighting it off because you have these swollen glands. All of those are actually good things because that means your body is healthy and it's a healthy attack at recognizing the problem and figuring out how to fight against it. Every symptom you feel is your body fighting off an infection, right? So at this point, you have all of these B cells, um, more than you need because you've now controlled the population. You don't need to make this many antibodies anymore. These, you don't need this many killer T cells going at the site of the infection anymore because it's been controlled. So most of these cells are going to die off. Your body is going to recognize you don't need all of these anymore. Most of them are going to die off. But some of those extra B cells are now going to stick around in your bloodstream so that the next time the same infection or the same pathogen is recognized, it doesn't have to go through all of these steps starting with the macrophage to the helper T cell all, all the way on until you finally recognize you need to start making antibodies to block them from getting into any more cells. Now we have these cells that we consider memory B cells. So now it mean, that means that these are B cells, again, that make antibodies so that if the same pathogen shows up again, and I mean the exact same pathogen shows up again in the future with the exact same shape of their antigen, that surface protein, then immediately, if the memory B cells are in, this, in the area, as they're going through your bloodstream, they, just like the macrophage, will recognize the threat, they'll remember it, and without having to wait for all of the intermediate steps, they'll immediately start making the antibodies against it and immediately start tagging and blocking the pathogen. So by immediately blocking and tagging the pathogen, you can fight off the infection way before it gets out of control. So if you're fighting off an infection that's extremely small, you usually won't even feel it because it's such a quick attack. The problem is because the steps involved in this third line of defense take a little while, it takes a little while for the macrophage to find it and then the helper T cell to match up and then to send out a message for the B cells and the killer T cells to replicate first and then go to the site of the infection and the B cells to make enough antibodies, all that takes time. And in the time, we've talked about how quick the lytic cycle is, one virus can turn into millions. 
So now we're talking about trying to fight off millions of viruses, which means you're going to have a very heavy attack, and that's why you feel all the symptoms you do. But if we're talking about catching it this early, and you have a memory B cell that catches it at the same time as the macrophage way at the beginning, and immediately it starts releasing these antibodies to block the pathogen from getting into a new cell or tag it to get destroyed, then you can control the population early before it gets out of control. And a lot of times it's so early you don't even feel a symptom from it. So this is how certain uh, viruses you only have to get one time and you never really have to worry about it again uh, because you're, you have memory cells in your body now to be able to recognize the same pathogen in the future and if it does, it'll immediately control it by releasing these antibodies and blocking it from getting into any more cells. Um, this is one uh, category of, of types of viruses that are very slow changing. So you only have to be uh, exposed to them one time in your entire life and you can pretty much protect yourself forever because you've made the memory cells the first time and that means any time in the future you're exposed to it, those memory cells immediately will get to work and you never have to go through the process. Uh, and, and feel sick because of it. But there are also a big category of viruses out there that are very fast changing. Because they change pretty quickly, your memory cells won't recognize the virus anymore if it comes back because it's not exactly the same. If the virus has changed just a little bit, that antigen, that surface protein has, has changed just a little degree, then your memory cells will no longer remember it. So now instead of being able to fight it off real fast, your body has to go through the whole process again and you feel sick all over again. So this is a perfect example of why you can get chicken pox once in your life and pretty much never have to worry about it again. Or you can take all of these series of vaccines when you're zero to six months, things like uh, smallpox and diphtheria and all these different vaccines that you can get early, early on in your life and never have to worry about again because those are things that don't change very quickly as compared to things like the flu where if you were to get the flu this year, there's just as good a chance that you're going to get it again next year because more than likely by next year, the strain of flu that's popular is not exactly the same as it was this year. So that means any memory cells you made this year to protect against that strain are going to be different, slightly different than the new strain, so you won't recognize it. You have to go through the whole process again. Uh, but if you get the flu once in the season, if you're ever exposed to that exact same strain of flu again within that season, your body can pretty much protect it. So there's a good chance of you not getting the flu twice in the same season, unless you're just so unlucky that you happen to get two different strains of the flu. But that's really how vaccines work as well. It's the whole idea of eventually making your memory cells. If you can make your memory cells, then you can protect yourself from that exact same pathogen if you were ever exposed to it again in the future. So that's how we call different types, what we call different types of immunity. So we'll get to that. But the key thing here is once your body has recognized that everything is under control, you've controlled uh, your, your pathogenic and population, you've got your memory cells to the point where they're the ones that are going to be there for future infections. Now it's time to make sure that our whole body has gone back to normal because at this point, your body has pretty much taken any excess energy from any other function that your body performs and focused it entirely into your immune response. That's why you become super tired, really fatigued, really weak when you're really sick because your body knows that at that moment your energy needs to be focused in on your immune system because you have to fight off this big infection. If you kept that up, then your body would break down after a while. You can't keep that up forever. So once you've gotten the population back under control, it's important that things are brought back down. Again, most of those B cells are going to die off. Some of them are going to stick around as memory cells. And then all of the other cells and components won't have as much energy coming to them everything will go back to normal. And the cells that bring everything back to normal are called suppressor T cells. So suppressor T cells, again, calm everything down. So they're the ones that recognize that the threat is controlled, so they tell the B cells to stop producing antibodies. They tell the killer T cells to stop going around and killing anything that's tagged with the antibodies or the cells that have been infected by the tagged pathogens. One way or the other, all of this stuff that's that's using up a whole lot of energy now that everything's been controlled it's all told to chill to just stop 
to go back to normal. You no longer have to have this specific attack against this specific pathogen. It's now back under control. Everything's good. Let's get things back to normal. Let's get the energy sent back to where it normally is throughout our body so that the rest of our cells can function the way they normally do. So the suppressor T cells bring everything back to normal. All right, so that's the basic components of your third line of defense. In, in a perfect scenario, everything works by the end, and you now have your memory cells that can control the population. So here's how the, those memory cells work. Notice this diagram here. On the y-axis here, it talks about antibody concentration. So that means the amount of antibodies that are made from one exposure to the next. The first exposure, the first time you're ever exposed to a pathogen, you go through the series of steps that will eventually recognize the exact antibodies that need to be made and then in the process it'll make them. This is a very long drawn out process and over the course of that time the amount of antibodies made at any given time is pretty low because you first have to figure out the problem, the threat, the B cells have to know they're supposed to go to work and then they start to replicate. On the other side, if you have memory cells in the area, the very beginning, then instead of waiting for all the processes and the macrophage to match up to the helper T cell to then send the signal to the B cell, which takes a long time, you immediately have B cells there, which means immediately you start making antibodies. So the amount of antibodies that are produced that next time around because of those memory B cells being at the site from the beginning is exponentially higher. So now you have way more antibodies being produced right from the beginning, which is why you can quickly control the population blocking those viruses so they can't enter into any more cells, you keep the viral population under control, or you're tagging the bacteria so that they can quickly be attacked and destroyed by the killer T cells rather than being able to feed off of other cells as freely as they would have been before. So one way or the other, because of those memory cells, the antibody production the second time around is significantly higher because it's a whole lot faster. And because of that, your body usually doesn't have to attack as hard for as long and can control the population. So you don't even feel it the next time you're exposed to the exact same pathogen. Your body is that good at controlling it because of those memory cells that are there. So all of these uses of developing the memory cells is what gives you the ability to control that population again in the future. We call that immunity. There are two different categories of immunity. There are what we call natural immunity and artificial immunity. Uh, you could probably break this down yourself, but a natural immunity means your body goes through the steps of basically getting sick in order to develop the memory cells necessary to be able to protect yourself from the same infection in the future. So if you were to get the flu um, and your body recognizes all of the steps and finally makes the memory B cells against that strain of the flu, then if you're exposed to that exact same strain of the flu again, usually throughout the same flu season, you won't have any sort of side effects because you'll immediately recognize it the second time, the secondary immune response, you have those memory cells making a whole lot more antibodies and controlling it faster. So you get the flu once, as long as you're not dealing with any other strains of the flu, you won't deal with that flu again. You'll be okay for the rest of the year. As compared to the artificial side, where you'd actually get a flu vaccine. Now a vaccine, is what we consider an, a weakened or attenuated or inactive form of a virus. All those words basically mean it's not the full, full on virus. It's not the same virus that you would be exposed to to develop a natural immunity. The virus that you're exposed to is weakened, which means it can't actually grow. It can't actually or get into cells and allow it to reproduce. So it can't make its population much bigger. But it does introduce a threat to your immune system so it goes through the same steps with the macrophage and everything else but it's just done on a much smaller level because it's not growing super fast your attack against it isn't super strong so your body does go through the steps of eventually making the memory cells against it but the process of doing it is usually much more controlled so it's very rare that you would feel any symptoms at all if anything you just feel a little weak or fatigued because your immune system does have to fight against it uh, it just isn't nearly as strong a fight as if you were getting the real flu, right? So that's what we consider a vaccine or artificial immunity. One way or the other, you develop the memory cells so that if you see the exact same pathogen again in the future, your cells, your memory cells can immediately release the antibodies to control the population. So that's about it, guys. That's your third line of defense. If everything works the way it's supposed to, you now have memory B cells against that exact pathogen. If you ever see it again, you can fight it off. If we are to the point where we're dealing with a virus that even this doesn't control, 
and your natural immune system is not doing enough to fight it off. Again, with a viral infection, you can't use antibiotics. It doesn't do anything to help. So usually if you go to the doctor with the flu or any kind of a viral infection that's not super strong, like um, you know swine flu or um, the West Nile or something like that, as long as it's not a really, really strong viral infection, then really all doctors will tell you to do is go home, rest, drink some fluids. They may give you something like a, like a Tamiflu, which is a, a prescription medication that's really more of just a, an, uh, an immune system boost. Um, but the best encouragement for you uh, and that I could give you would be not to worry so much about medications, just to kind of sit back and let your body fight, have the full-on fight, because medications really suppress your immune system response. All of those symptoms you feel that you don't, that make you feel uncomfortable, actually, what are trying to keep the virus uncomfortable and keep it from functioning the way it's supposed to. So taking medications actually make it harder for your immune system to fight off the infection. So as long as we're not dealing with a, a life-threatening disease or a fever that's over 102 or something like that. The best thing you can do is just sit back and let your body do its thing. Uh, but what you can do is make sure you're getting plenty of fluids, make sure you're getting plenty of nutrients, um, drink, uh, you know, plenty of sugars and, and things to help your body fight it off. And also just vitamins, uh, supplements, especially vitamin C, uh, are very strong for boosting your immune system. So all you can, the best thing you can do is really just sit back and let your body fight it off if it's a viral infection. Uh, if it's a bacterial infection, again, as long as it's not resistant, you can introduce antibiotics to help keep the bacterial population under control. So then it's much easier for your immune cells to fight it off with a smaller population than one that's replicating a lot more quickly. So there you go, guys. That's your third line of defense. Hopefully you've learned a lot, and I really hope you can relate all of this to your everyday life. We're in flu season right now. I'm sure if you're not sick, you know somebody that is, and you can walk them through exactly what they're feeling and tell them why they're feeling the way they are. And hopefully... You guys can laugh about it when it's all said and done, and you can tell them how those memory B cells will protect them for the rest of the season. So thanks, guys. Enjoy, uh, enjoy the rest of your night. I'll see you next time.